Very good. And can you tell us in which war you served in? Uh, Vietnam. You served in the Vietnam War. Uh, what branch of service? Uh, in the Army. And uh, I graduated from Officer Candidate School in 1969 right. and um, became a second lieutenant. All right. So your highest rank was second lieutenant? My highest rank was first lieutenant. Okay. And did you go to OCS after basic training? Yes, I ended up in the Army in, in September of 1968. Mm -hmm. uh, graduated from college in 1968. Uh, that was when the draft was still very, very active. Okay. And as long as you were in college, you had a college deferment. Once I graduated, my status changed to uh, the draft that point would have been 1A, which, uh, and I was assured that I would be drafted very quickly. Uh, <clears throat> so, Instead of waiting for that to happen, I enlisted in the Army for the Guarantee of Officer Candidate School. Mm -hmm. uh, went through basic training at Fort Dix, New Jersey. Uh, started that in September of 68. Did my advanced training uh, at Fort Dix. Although some humor with that is we did advanced jungle operations in the middle of the winter <laughs> at Fort Dix in the snow, so it's... You know, some silliness to that. Um, but then started infantry officer uh, candidate school in January of 69 uh, at Fort Benning, Georgia. Very good. All right, so you were in Fort Benning for OCS. You were at Fort Dix for basic. Uh, yes. Can you tell us generally, uh, quickly, just the locations that you served in throughout your service? Uh, started at Fort Dix, New Jersey for basic training and advanced infantry training. Fort Benning, Georgia, for Officer Candidate School, and after graduation from Officer Candidate School for about 11 months there as a basic training officer in a basic training company at, at uh, Fort Benning. Okay. From Fort Benning, spent a few weeks in Panama for the Jungle Operations Training School in, in Panama. And then went to uh, Vietnam for 11 months and two weeks. All right. Did you, after you came back uh, from Vietnam, did, were you still in or did you get out? When we came back from Vietnam, uh, I was probably in the Army for another uh, two days. Two days, okay. They uh, didn't want us and we didn't want them. And so uh, just everybody was um, discharged at that point in time. Mm -hmm. The paperwork says that we were discharged the reserves, but they were, it's inactive. I never saw any military issues from the day I left uh, uh, Oakland, California to come back home. All right. So uh, you said that you were drafted. Can you tell us a little bit about Well, I technically wasn't drafted. Okay. I beat them to it. Okay. Uh, and so really you could, I joined and volunteered at that point in time in order to get something I wanted instead of doing just what they would have wanted me to do. Right. So I had a little bit of choice. And that was the OCS? That was the officer candidate school. Okay. That was, the, that was the biggest deal for me. Okay. So instead of them drafting you, you decided to I, draft right. yourself. <laughs> and that was, that was fairly common at that point in time, with the, especially your college graduates doing okay. that. We all knew we were going to get drafted. There was no, no doubt about it because it was all, it was 68. Right after Tet, and so it was. It was a matter of, uh, of it was going to happen. Right. Okay. So why did you choose OCS? Why did I choose OCS? It was um, basically twofold. One, it would I knew it would delay the amount of time I had before I ended up in Vietnam, mm -hmm. but also I liked the idea of being a young officer rather than a young enlisted. Uh, it's just a matter of having some more of your own choices to make um, and not being quite so dependent on, on what they want you to do. That's right. uh, I also thought it was probably in the military a bit of a better life of uh, being a young officer than being a young enlisted guy. Okay. So after basic training, because that's what you did first, mm -hmm. you went to OCS. Can you tell us maybe uh, the differences, your experience of the differences? You know, OCS was, um, was a challenge. Uh, my numbers are off a little bit, but I think we started off with a company of about 240, 200, around that. 
and probably about 140 of us graduated. Wow. Uh, the dropout rate was 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 huge, um, and people just could not do physically or emotionally could not do it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it was challenging physically, emotionally, a bit academically, um, but sometimes I would the easiest part for me were academics, and so sometimes I would let that slough because I knew I could pass. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't care whether I was first in my class or last just as long as I graduated. Mm -hmm. And since some of the physical and emotional were harder for me, that's where I put my my energy in to be able to uh, to get through that. Um, and Georgia in the summertime can be very warm. Um, but it was it was a uh, looking at back at it, but it's almost 50 years later. It was a good experience. Fifty years ago, nah, it wasn't such a good experience. All right. All right. So you were in Georgia for OCS. In Georgia for both OCS, and after that, uh, as part of a basic training company. Okay. Uh, at Fort Benning. All right. So what were your duties there? The duties of base in, in a <clears throat> basic training company was. Overseeing the training they got, uh, planning some of the training, especially the field operations of it, uh, and learning the ins and outs of the bureaucracy of the Army. Uh, one of the interesting experiences I had there is that somehow, for some reason, I was assigned to be the uh, defense counsel for the brigade around uh, court marshals. In 68, that was before the Army had the rule you had to be a attorney or a JAG officer to be a defense counsel or prosecutor in your basic court marshals. Okay. Um, so I ended up being the defense counsel. Now, all, anything we really did was... A walls, stupid stealing, a little bit of marijuana, you know, what we would consider to be somewhat minor stuff. Uh, but neither the lieutenant who was the prosecutor nor myself were were um, were attorneys. Mm -hmm. Both college graduates, but that's about about it. That was also the point in time where the Cali trials were beginning to happen. Um, I'm making an assumption that you know what that is. Yeah, you can explain it. Um, Lieutenant Kelly was accused of a massacre uh, in a village in Vietnam. Okay. And uh, was being prosecuted for those murders. It was a very large, large issue. The point for me became, as I was doing these small court martials, the then major who was overseeing the court martials as the judge uh, was a man named Reed Kennedy. Colonel Kennedy, later became a colonel, was the trial judge for the Cali trials. The JAG officers who we were able to work with uh, for our little things were the JAG officers who formerly prosecuted or defended Lieutenant Cowley. Okay. And so as some of those preliminary hearings were going on and famous attorneys were coming and going, uh, I got to see a glimpse of, of that uh, from other than just reading the newspaper and knowing some of the, some of the people involved and some of the discussions around the uh, ethical behavior of platoon leaders in in Vietnam and it was a an interesting and sobering and uh, uh, you know thing to watch and, and hear people talk about that were actually part of it okay how did this affect your outlook of the military I don't know if it affected the outlook as much as as much as I was I was sometimes either amazed or chagrined at um, the intensity of what was what was happening. Um, 
and because it had huge emotional uh, impact for all sorts of people, whether you, you uh, wanted to defend him for what he did or had to do, or whether you thought he was, you know, a horrible monster. Um, but it really kind of pointed out some of the conversations of what is, I hate to say it, what's the ethics of killing people? Um, and how do you try to determine what is really off limits as far as innocent civilians, especially women, especially children, versus somebody who could be a combatant? Um, and uh, some of those debates is very clear what Lieutenant Callie did was uh, barbaric and uh, never should happen. But sometimes the emotion. Um, the emotion of the moment uh, can really overwhelm any judgment you, you may or may not have. So before you even got to Vietnam, you were exposed to these ethics? Yeah. Before I even came close to getting there. So did this worry you as to how you might react when you got there? No, it didn't worry me or concern me at all. It was, it was much more for me a kind of a... Uh, you know, a... a intellectual experience, like what is this all about? Mm -hmm. Somehow when you're brand new, you really can't process in your own mind the realities of what have happened or are going to happen. Right. You can picture it, you can think about it, um, but it's it's in your head, not in your gut. It's in your gut after you do it. Um, but it, it just is... Point out some of the, I guess it's the worrisome, worrisome things that could happen, mm -hmm. and how that debate could play out. Okay. Uh, the other thing I think of being at Fort Benning and being at uh, OCS in, in that period of time, which was, you know, the whole '69, early part of the '70s. In many ways, then, when a lot of the really serious protests around Vietnam were happening. You were very much aware of it, mm -hmm. but you were also quite insulated from it. Because being, living on a military base, being part of that every day and working, um, you see your side of life, and you don't really see what's happening outside of you. Right. Uh, you're so busy doing what you're doing, and it you know, at 24, 25, you don't read the newspaper every day or you don't turn on uh, the news every night because you're not there to do that, you know? So you don't hear what uh, the newscasters are saying or or a lot of the fall around, around that. Uh, so it doesn't matter whether... I mean, it's just you're, you're, you're in your own community, you're in your own cocoon sometimes, and so you're not completely aware of what's happening. Well, being a part or being in a leadership position, you're sort of tapped into you know, your soldiers and anybody that you're in charge of beneath you. So, did you see that maybe uh, it was affecting them? I think I saw it affecting young men coming into the army, going through okay. through the basic training, because there were some questions, attitudes that reflected that they were much more aware or uh, were either hopeful or resentful okay. of, of where they were and what they were, were doing. There was um, both sets of emotions were involved and you, you saw people, young guys com coming in. Um, by and large it worked, it worked fine, but um, it was always an issue. How did you deal with it? You sucked it up in debt. Just, 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 just move on. Drink water. There's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can, uh, you know, become involved in with it. Um, it just, it, it became a, you just try to keep it from becoming a distraction. Right. Because if you're distracted too much by it, you can get yourself killed. So. And the best way to do that? Is ignore. Just through training. Just through training. Mm -hmm. Because it was, it was happening in a different part of the community than you were living in. Mm -hmm. You know, it really didn't come into your community. And my community was an army base that 
was its own its own population, its own community, uh, and plus being in uh, rural Georgia, it was not exactly a hotbed of, of uh, anti-war right. you know, material. It wasn't like you were in, uh, you know, Boston or New Haven, Connecticut, or something like that. <laughs> All right, so you're in the OCS uh, Defense Council. Yes. Um, and after that. It was, you know, the whole defense council thing was just was a piece of what you what I was doing. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes, some days it took more time than others, but the rest of the time was basically in the basic training company. You know, being a range officer as they were learning, you know, to use the M16s and even then it was still some of the M14s. Uh, Using their weapons, uh, doing tactical operations, um, teaching some of the uh, classroom stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a busy day. It's a long day, uh, a long week, and it can go, you know, seven days a week, and just just keep going at it. Uh, but it was a it was a learning experience. It's kind of a, a, a decent life, you know, being being there and being a basic training company. Um, and you get a lot, of, know a lot of people, hear a lot of stories. Some are just stories, and some of them are, you know, better than others. Uh, either more entertaining or uh, of, of more learning value, depending upon who was doing it. But um, but every lieutenant there in each company had usually two. Everybody knew where you were headed next and what the what was what was on the agenda. And so that was really a lot of conversation amongst the, the guys just about. And it really had to do when you were commissioned as to when you were going. Okay. Um, because usually most of the lieutenants ended up in Vietnam within 10 months to a year after commissioning. Um, and since we're all at various times, whether you're from ROTC or OCS, um, you know, everybody was kind of coming and going. And so there was a lot of discussion around that and where people thought they would end up or what they thought they would do. Right. Going back quickly, uh, do you remember any of those basic training stories? Anything that stands up or stands out above the rest? No, because basic training stories now become, to me, are just kind of, I, I actually don't remember a lot of it. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I mean, more because other events have overtaken that. Um, you know, is uh, you know, I can remember vividly the, the two, three weeks in, in, in Panama at the jungle operations uh, school there. Uh, was that after OCS? That was jungle operations training in Panama was after uh, being a training officer in a basic training company. Okay. But before I went to Vietnam, there was that two or three week period right. there that it was another training program to kind of orient you towards what the real weather and operations would be okay. uh, when you got to Vietnam. So let's talk about that a little bit. Your yeah. first experience in you know tropical country as a OCS officer. You know the first the the experience in Panama. Uh, I actually kind of liked it. Uh, it was hard it was just field operations but uh, it was it was a, a very safe place and so you weren't worried about that at all and uh, as I say I, I had a chance to have a government sponsored ecological tour of the interior of Penn wow. uh, not everybody can be paid to spend two weeks inside of the jungles of Panama I'm being very facetious. <laughs> Um, and so it was uh, tactics, nighttime operations, uh, a lot of maneuvering and walking, um, learning repelling, um, doing some of the slides for life across uh, some of the tributaries of the canal. Uh, first time I've seen some really big lizards, <laughs> uh, you know, and... Uh, so it, it was fascinating, yeah. you know, in one way and another way you could complain about it. But uh, since that was your life to come, you 
you kind of want to make the best of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, naturally, there were some very stupid people there who weren't, weren't making the best of it. Uh, but that was detrimental to their own health by, by being that way. Right. Right. And then from there we came <clears throat> uh, came back home for a little bit, like a week or so, and then left for uh, Vietnam. And uh, we left from uh, Travis Air Force Base in Oakland, California. Made a quick stop in Hawaii and the Philippines. Okay. When I say quick, I mean measure in hours. All right. And arrived on a very hot day in Saigon. Uh, the first thing they had us do was once we knew our assignments would be MACV, our Military Assistance Command, Vietnam. Okay. Uh, in which, for all practical purposes, my entire OCS company went over in the same plane and were all assigned to MACV. Mm-hmm. And so it was like they just, okay, here's a group of guys. And, you know, the Defense Department was able to make one assignment. And then when we got to Vietnam, they sorted us out, mm-hmm. you know, as to where we would go. And the company really tra- uh, was broken up throughout the entire country. Um, I had one other one other OCS graduate uh, out of my company ended up in the same province I was in. And so I saw him occasionally. Okay. But uh, the first thing they had us do was go to a uh, kind of an introduction school. I can't remember what they what they called it for uh, about ten days. It was really an orientation to the company uh, to the country. And since we're all being assigned as part of the advisory group, just what the the initial roles that everybody would play in in that, because most of us went out to be either. Um, to start on what they call mobile advisory teams. Mm -hmm. And so we all went to various teams across the country. Um, And those teams usually had two lieutenants, a first lieutenant and second lieutenant, or sometimes, you know, two first, depends how long they were there. And usually three NCOs. Mm -hmm. Um, Usually one of them was a medic. And the other two were either uh, sergeants, E6s, E7s. Uh, Most of those guys had done at least one previous tour. And the whole job of the mobile advisory teams uh, was to teach, instruct, and guide the Vietnamese forces in a given area as far as... um, military uh, operations. Some went into uh, regular uh, Vietnam's regular army. Uh, most of a lot of us went into teams that did what were then uh, RFs, which I think are regional forces, which is kind of like our National Guard, or PFs, which is a popular force which is a ragtag bunch of guys with guns. Uh, These Vietnamese soldiers. Vietnamese soldiers. Um, we refer to them as rough puffs. And um, some of the RFs, the regional forces guys, they're pretty good, mm-hmm. you know, for what we were doing. Some of the PF forces you were training and doing things with, um, you really wanted to encourage them to stay home. Uh, because sometimes doing things with them was more dangerous to you than it was, you know, the enemy. Um, and a lot of them were either older men or really, really boys. And is this uh, something that they were drafted into, or did they choose? Um, I don't think in Vietnam. I think you had a choice of being one side or the other. I think you, I don't think anybody had a lot of right. a lot of choice. Um, and so we, we worked with that type of a group fairly shortly after we started with some of the PFs we decided that wasn't really a healthy way to go and kind of minimized that effort and stayed with the uh, RF companies and platoons um, and ended up with them doing a substantial amount of 
platoon and squad size operations. Um, and as the mobile advisor team, you are in charge of their training. Their training and supporting their operations. Okay. Usually two or th- depends how large the the mobile advisory or MAT team was. Okay. We go out on operations with them. Two or three of us would go. Uh, we also then control access to artillery gunships uh, mm-hmm. because they would be the U.S. size of the artillery and the gunships, uh, and kind of made sure they were doing things. I don't want to say the right way, but a decent way to get the job done. Uh, right. And sometimes it was ensuring that they were really doing what they said they were going to do. Was it still in Saigon? No, this is by the time I got out into the into the field. Where was this? Um, after I left Saigon, I went to, they assigned me to a, an area in a province called Bintuan, mm-hmm. which the main city there is Phan Thiet. Okay. And my guess, it's about 100 miles northeast of Saigon. Okay. It's right on the coast. Um, we, we stayed basically on the in the coastal areas and not going up into the the mountains there because it kind of it's where the central highlands kind of comes down and curves itself into the and so it hits the south china sea All right. um, but from the training school in saigon to going to the mat teams that was Less than three weeks from, you know, by the time you started the training to actually happened, got out in the field. Happened quickly. Happened quickly. The first team I was assigned to um, was, a, was a team, a district that had two MAC teams in it. Um, and we served probably about, a, you know, less than a kilometer apart from what we were doing. But my introduction to a MAC team was that I replaced an officer uh, who had been killed less than a month before I, I got there. And um, he had been killed inside the compound. Really? Sitting at a table with several of his Vietnamese counterparts, a disgruntled soldier rolled a grenade under the table and killed the killed him and a couple of the other of the other officers. And so that is the first story that I walked into. Uh, naturally, it wasn't a harmonious relationship between the advisors in that compound and the Vietnamese, although it was it was getting better and better every every day. This was a Vietnamese soldier that. This was a Vietnamese soldier that rolled the grenade. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and so it was a. Uh, it was it was a difficult time for everybody, and I'm walking into this totally naive. Um, you know, as, as new of a lieutenant as you can be going into Vietnam, and so, you know, it's just, oh, by the way, here's what happened. You know, that's kind of great big, oh. And uh, it gets your attention very quickly. Yeah, how did you feel about and, that? And so, scared the hell out of me. Right. Just, just... Of matter of fact with it and it puts your whole trust factor at, at um, uh, a high intensity and which is for a few for a while being out there yeah, it's not a bad thing to have your trust factor be, be challenged um, but uh, stayed there with them for probably about a month uh, <clears throat> living in a uh, a very rustic compound of uh, sandbags, uh, <clears throat> chain link fence, and, and um, barbed wire uh, to keep you going. The interesting part of it was learning that <clears throat> our area of the compound, we also had put up chain link fence. It was about six feet high. The U.S. area. U.S. area. Our little corner. Okay. And... Again, being naive, I said, what's the chain link fence for? Uh, and the basic thing you learn very quickly is that with the B-40 rockets that the, the Viet Cong and stuff used, they would explode when they hit that fence. And so they would completely come, you know, come through. Uh, 
So you, you really had to be concerned about the explosive, the shrapnel that came with that, but it would, you know, wouldn't penetrate a, a bunker wall or something like that. Um, so that first compound of stuff, I got my, my baptism into Vietnam from the murder of my predecessor, that's the only way you can describe this murder, uh, to the ins and outs of building bunkers in a compound, uh, an introduction to having weapons that you really weren't supposed to have, but you had them. Um, you know, Lieutenant Matt Teams was supposed to have a, you know, an M16 and a, you know, a few other odds and ends. The fact that we had a, a mortar and a 50 caliber machine gun and, you know, an M16 machine gun that somehow were scrounged right. um, just made life all the more interesting. Uh, in the beginning, you kind of tried to hide those things when some of the inspectors from uh, much higher up came around so they didn't know you had them. But after you'd been there long enough, you really didn't care whether they knew or not. Right. Um, it was kind of your life, not theirs. And so, uh, you know, you, you had these silly things. And, you know, thinking back on it, I don't know why we did it, because they, apparently they were big and they, they worked, but they were kind of a pain in the butt to... Uh, keep armed and, you know, right. to work through. But when you stop and think you can go out and scrounge, borrow, or find an M60 machine gun or a 50 caliber machine gun, it's like, whoa, <laughs> that's a different life. Right. So, um, but I stayed in that combo probably about a month. Okay. Uh, before I got, I was told to move to a different uh, mobile advisory team. And that was from being the assistant on the first one to being the team leader on um, the second one. And on that one, I was the only officer with three other uh, NCOs. Where did you move to? We, I moved up the coast before I was south of Fantiat. Now I went north of it into what we called a district called Hylong, which... Its historical name and its name today is Mui Ne. Okay. Um, and the road was, <clears throat> seriously, right along the coast out into a peninsula. And the district was a dominated by fishing villages. Okay. Um, with the coast to your one side and then up into uh, a heavily forested area. And when I say forest, they were low kind of scrub trees, uh, either small trees or huge bushes, uh, where we did most of the operations from there. But it was very different from the farming district I was in before than when I started. And so there was um, my MAT team. There was a small group of advisors for the National Police Force that was there. And... Uh, we all essentially lived in a uh, district compound uh, where the Vietnamese district chief lived and where the major RF company was, was stationed. And <clears throat> the interesting thing about that compound is it was really built uh, in the 50s as, as part of the 1950s war that went on there. And it was a the walls, there was there were stone walls around the entire compound. There were a combination of stone and concrete that were probably a foot, a foot and a half thick, hmm. um, that dated back to the to the fifties. I think. Uh, in one way it was fascinating, and another way it was like, you know, a whole other, a whole other world. Did and you it, feel safer here? No, you didn't just feel safe. In one way you didn't, one way you didn't. We didn't hesitate to build our own bunker with inside of that. Right. Um, and both for our ammunition and for our own safety, we build a bunker. And when we build it inside, you take your first row is, is 55 gallon drums. Um, you fill it with sand, you know, and you stack them up two or three high. Mm -hmm. But then we're, that compound, we were right against the. the, the uh, the walls. So if anything hit the wall, 
we still had the, the drums and stuff, you know, there. And then we built everything then around it. Uh, again, with the 55-gallon drums, a couple layers of sandbags. Um, you were pretty fortified. Hmm? You are pretty fortified. Oh, yeah. You want to you wanna have... You want to have some sort of, of, of a place to go that, um, you know, you've got some, you know, fighting chance, you know, from. Right. And also in that bunker is where we, we kept uh, a lot of the extra ammunition for everything we had. So it was accessible right there. Um, and like every place else, we ranged it with a uh, chain link fence. Okay. You know, so it's it, uh, pretty pretty solid stuff. <laughs> um and also, every place you went, you also, when you built the roof of a bunker, then we would use um, the corrugated steel. We would get some of that, which was the same corrugated steel that they built temporary run runways with. Mm -hmm. And so when you put something like that on top and a couple layers of sandbags, um, nothing's going to come through. Nothing that anybody has is going to come through that you know, real easy. Right. Yeah, you know, we take a direct hit from a from a small mortar or something like that. Um, so you were doing your uh, Matt is the right. mobile advisory team. You were doing the same thing from the other base here, you, you, but as a leader. As a leader, leader. and it didn't. It kind of didn't matter where you were, uh, as far as being a a Matt team. You did the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's just a different geography, a different set of. Of Vietnamese soldiers you're working with, uh, their skill sets or their attitudes are, you know, better or worse. Uh, but the Hai the Long or the Mui Ne team, they, they were decent, decent soldiers, did a decent job of what they were doing. Um, and, and as I said there, we either did nothing more than platoon size contacts, many of them squad size. The thing we focused on more than anything was mechanical mines and booby traps. Okay. Um, one, teaching the Vietnamese how to, not just to say how to make the booby traps, and most of the stuff we used was Claymore mines with a single D battery that, you know, as soon as they touched, you know, right. set, set them off using, using dead cords. But, where to place them. Right. Um, in the beginning when we got there, they were placing, they were kind of trying to protect the village. And so they would place these doggone things right on the edge or inside the village. And so probably the first couple months we had more villagers killed than we did, oh. you know, the other way. And so our first job was really to get them to take these damn things outside the village. You know, kind of move them further out onto the onto the trails and where, you know, the uh, Viet Cong may or may not be com coming in. Mm -hmm. um, and so we did all these, we did the, the booby traps and stuff, whether we used a single Claymore mine or strung two or three of them out using deck cord. Uh, we did a lot of that. Okay. Um, and then we do go up in some of the night operations into the into the into the forest, but also what we call the forest. There were remnants of villages that were there. That as the war moved on, the Vietnamese government made the people abandon these villages and move into temporary ones. What they all saw was temporary, but they could be fifteen, twenty years as being temporary. <laughs> Uh, and so some of these abandoned villages were up in, in the forest, and uh, that was both good news and bad news. Uh, the good news is if you went up and you found a place like that, it was a, you know, a good place to stay during the day, did operations at night, and move out of there. The bad news was the Viet Cong did the same thing. Right. And so sometimes they would be there. Um, and so it was just kind of, I guess, who got there first is who got to use it but, you know, and fight from one of those positions. Can you uh, describe one of the operations? Any of that? You know, it, it, they were kind of typical one. To, there's kind of three typical things that would, would happen. Uh, besides, you know, going up and nothing happening. Uh, 
Mm. One of the typical ones with the mechanical minds are booby traps. We go up with a a small platoon, a large squad, and we would set one of these up. Uh, you didn't want to set too many up because remember in the morning you're going to have to find them. Uh, and above all, you want to remember where you put them. Um, and usually what would happen with those is somebody would come across it, they would set it off, um, it would do a huge amount of damage to whoever set it off or whatever group was there. And sometimes from that, then there would be a small firefight, you know, after that. Um, we never lost an American in, in any of that. Uh, we always, the advisory team always came out of that unscathed. Um, the group we were with always came up better than those that we ambushed. Um, you know, so that was kind of one. It's a small three, four guys. That's about, about it. Some of the other things we would do then would be a squad or platoon operation. It could be an ambush without the mechanicals. Uh, it could be a day or early evening operation where you just, you'd run into a group or you'd find a group where they would find you. Um, and you get yourself into what I would just call an old-fashioned firefight. Um, and um, depending on where everything was, how, how it came out, you know, geographics. Geography seemed to play a huge role into how, how it went, uh, kind of like who had the better ground and where, you know, able to, to move about. And fundamentally, you would end up with mostly M16s against AK-47s or that variety. Occasionally, they would have an old M16. Uh, most of them either had, uh, the Vietnamese always had a lot of 60 millimeter mortars, which are very small. Uh, and that's kind of what you engage in. Sometimes you'd have an M60, uh, and they would be short. They wouldn't last 20 minutes an hour. That's, that's it. And sometimes you didn't even have time to do artillery or gunships. Um, I almost want to say we maybe once, almost never hit something that was a, a company size operation uh, because that became sometimes more than we had the ability to sustain. Mm -hmm. um, you could extract yourself out of those with a little bit of artillery or gunship, um, but you got to that size of operation with our talent and equipment, it wasn't wise to, you know, to do that. If it got any bigger than that, my thing is then you called the real army and you got the hell out of there. Um, and I think that only happened maybe once in a different part where we found a, a fairly large group. And that was then it was just to let everybody know they were there and get out of there. Because it just wasn't wise to... Did they engage you? Uh, they knew where they were. There. They knew we were there. Okay. Uh, I would say it was quick, and um, we left. Right. I mean, why be stupid as far as having, you know, twenty guys take on three hundred? I mean, it's when you're out in the field. I mean, it's just not not a wise thing to do. Right. Um, saying that wise is kind of a funny way of putting it, but you know, it's like suicidal to do that. Right. Um, but there was enough support there that you could tell your your headquarters exactly where they were, and then they could deal with it from you know different ways. I mean, we could stay where the artillery coming in, and we could stay there with gunships until they got there. But as far as you know, uh, unit to unit to engage them was just not a mm -hmm. you know not a smart thing to do, and and we weren't not going to be stupid. Um, but our experience around that was very, very different and in many ways le in less intense than many of the other American units and veterans that were in especially northern parts of, of um, Vietnam where 
they did engage the big battles, the big uh, heavy artillery duels, the whole thing like that. Um, mine was not that experience. Mine was much lower key. Um, you know, not being out in the field for weeks or, you know, at a time, being out there only a couple of days, a few days, and being able to go back to a constant uh, safe and well-stocked, you know, compound to go back into. Uh, it was it was a much, I would call it a much lower-key operation. Um, and like I said earlier, we never lost uh, an American soldier in any of my operations, uh, which was, you know, that's an accomplishment. Yes. I mean, a lot of us said the only thing we ever wanted out of the Army was us with no holes. Mm -hmm. And we achieved that. You know, and I can't say that uh, everybody achieved that. And so, uh, that's why I say it's kind of a lower key. But I stayed in this one province, or this one district for, yeah, it's probably four or five months. Okay. And then they moved me further north, or up the highway, to another city called Fanricua. Free, uh, much more urban. Vietnamese standards, urban, not ours. Uh, very large fishing, you know, port, fishing area. And it was close to the mountains in a district called Wada, H U A D A, um, <clears throat> with a very large mil American military base in in the area. Uh, and we were off off on a map, probably about five or six miles from the the, uh, the military base there. The soldiers and stuff we dealt with there were tactically not nearly as good as the ones we, I had before. The compound I lived in was um, much, much more open, uh, harder to defend. We built a new bunker there. Um, Again, using the same, you know, 55-gallon drop sandbags. Uh, but we got to build that structure. <clears throat> I don't know how we came up with them. I don't remember. But the supports were 12 by 12 pieces of, of oak or something. 12 by 12. Probably some of them were, the main beams were probably 25 feet long. Wow. Heavy. Believe me, nothing yeah. was coming through that stuff. Um, and there were f six of us, I think, that lived in that bunker. Uh, again, the 12 by 12s, the perf the steel tops, you know, the, the wire. It's You build one and you try to build them all the, you know, the same way. Right. And so, you know, we were, we were not not safe. I mean, we were fine. Mm -hmm. You know, that uh, enough stuff we could hold on, on, on there. And that compound really never had any issues on the inside of it. Um, it was always come and go. Uh, right outside of the compound were the, the village wells. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that kind of stuff. Oh, here's the big difference between the two places. Let me go back to the experience in sure. Highland. Is those fishing villages were probably as poor in third world as one can be. There was no electricity in any way, shape, or form. No running water in any way, shape, or form. No bathrooms. The bathroom was the beach. It flushed twice a day. Or up into, up, up into the jungle. Um, probably half, three quarters of the kids, basically boys, uh, didn't have clothes. Didn't wear clothes. Um, a lot of the teenagers when they were out in the fishing boats they didn't work close it was just as as third world as we would know it today as you as you really could get in some of these outlying villages um, wonderful people uh, some of them shoot you just as soon as look at you but otherwise they were, they were, I mean it was fine uh, interesting food if you wanted to try it but there's nothing wrong with Good fresh fish, good fresh rice, you know, uh, cooked in, in banana leaves. 
Um, but the, the, the po- what we would call the poverty, the starkness of it, uh, was dramatic. Mm-hmm. Um, there were thatch houses, you know, a, a few ones made out of, of brick or, or something like that. But it was just, um, well, as basic living as one could get. Um, and then when I moved up into the Fan, Fan Kua area, then that was much more of a city, and um, <clears throat> we wouldn't call it refined by our standards by any means. But, um, you know, as far as kids wearing clothes, as far as working, as far as, you know, there were more, more motorcycles and umbrellas, and, you know, than the other place. It was very different. Um, and in some ways, they weren't as serious about what was what was going on. But as we did some operations out of there and moved what would be deeper into the forest, more towards the mountains, the more the closer we came to some of the mountain areas and stuff, then the contacts became somewhat larger right. and he knew they were there. Um, and probably the the biggest thing that happened there was I think it was in a <clears throat> uh, my recollection of probably January of seventy the Viet Cong hit the military the army base there hard, uh, very hard, um, just about destroyed the whole artillery side and that. And so while we were thankfully I was not inside the big base at that time, we were back at our compound. You fundamentally, when you couldn't watch it because you know you you stayed inside the bunker, but between the radio and the sound, you could hear what was going on, and it was uh, it was a very large operation as far as what was what was happening, okay. uh, with substantial destruction and um, casualties inside that base, and because for our area that was the main one of the main artillery you know sources you know for us. How far away was the, are the were the two bases? Our small compound from the big one was, is my recollection, is maybe five six miles, nice. maybe ten miles by road, and five or six as the crow flies. Mm. Um, and so that was that was that piece of it. So in one way, there was more activity there, uh, substantially different in terms of size and complexity. But the RF groups that we were with were less engaged in that and more the regular Vietnamese army, the American army were were there. Mm -hmm. Um, There was also a small artillery base just up the road from us, a couple of miles, an American base that was uh, 105s that we used a bit. Mm -hmm. Um, And we'd go up and hang out there every once in a while. Did your RF unit, the unit that you were in charge of, ever support the uh, unit that was in the base? No. Um, or vice versa? They supported. Okay. It was their artillery that supported us when we needed them. Okay. Uh, we would go up there. When I say we would go up there, the MAT team would occasionally go up there mm-hmm. more to talk to other Americans and hang out with them during the day. Uh, Do you remember what unit it was? No, I don't remember at all. Okay. I have no recollections of units, uh, <laughs> you know, very much anymore. All right. So between the two bases, uh, it sort of seems like one was more humbling than another, uh, being more impoverished and yeah. friendlier. Yes. Uh, can you tell me what the daily life was like for you? The daily life... Uh, Going back to the the high long area in the poor villages, the the daily life is is we would work a lot and informally in the village during the during the day. Um, one of the things that strikes in my mind, there were two little kids there, um, a brother and a sister. Probably the boy was maybe nine, uh, little girl maybe six, and. Um, those two little kids were covered from head to foot in scabs. I don't know what it was, um, but um, 
they they were they were just they were covered and um, so somehow we decided that that wasn't was we didn't like that and so we decided that we would try to fix it and so probably several weeks we went into that village every day with our own water physahex soap and gave those kids a bath. Um, I'll show you a picture of it later, but uh, we would just give the kids a bath every single day with medicated soap, and we decided to use our own source of water, so we were somewhat comfortable that the water we were using didn't have something in it that was causing, causing that. And over time, I mean, they it began to heal up. Um, the funny part of it, these kids were so small. Uh, and the one NCO that was with us, uh, that was the medic, was a, was a very large man. Uh, I don't know how it was, 6'2 or so, and he had uh, way over 200 pounds. He was just a big guy. And so, I mean, this guy the size of his hands, and these, you know, kids and... You know, those little bottoms just will fit in one hand. Um, but we washed them and washed them and washed them. And making a long story short, it really cleaned the kids up. Um, and that turned out to be something that a lot of people were grateful for. Mm -hmm. uh, made our life some a lot easier. And people relaxed a little bit more around us. And even to the point where when I went from... High along back up to, to Fan Ray in that area. I didn't know at the time that these kids had a much older brother that was in the regular Vietnamese army. But he came, somehow he came up and found me in Fan Ray and said his father had told him to come and find me to say thank you. <laughs> and it was like just both strange, humbling, and, and how much that family went to find us, right. you know, to say something like that. Um, and then it coincidentally, or unco later on, I went back to Highland. And uh, uh, when I went back there for the second time, that whole thing made a, made life fairly easy for me there. Uh, I didn't feel threatened or anything like that from them. Something else happened later, but... Uh, it was it was an interesting part of just what happens when you when you put an effort into somebody or something inside that village right. uh, that isn't threatening to anybody. And I guess the world over, if you do something for a couple of little kids, um, it it matters to you. It matters to uh, uh, to everybody. And so that's what we, we we did there. But it's it's doing some things like that. Um, getting to know the village, getting to know the territory around it. You know, just as whoever I replaced in that area as he went home, mm -hmm. well, I didn't know the area as well as he knew it, so I had to relearn it. And doing things like that, just, just moving on the outsides of the village and discovering the trails, discovering just where everything, where everything was, mm -hmm. uh, and learning the ins and outs of, of the daily flow of a village. Because if all of a sudden you're used to a daily flow and it's different that day, then something's happening. Right. You, it just, you got to pay attention to it. And it may be absolutely nothing or normal, in, or it may be they know something you don't know. And so you, you, you pay attention to things like that. How often does that happen? Not often, but, you know, it's... it's um, you know that there's large families who are VC in that village, right. and when they start behaving differently, it just you pay attention. Right. Uh, and one of the things we laughed about is um, often in the village there wasn't a lot of men from 18 to 40. Not a real lot of them. But boy, they were babies. Uh, so we figured somebody had to be coming in. Right. Um, so when the pattern changes, you, you, you kind of pay attention to it. And you learn sometimes to 
figure out what it is or sometimes just to to back off. <laughs>